Next speaker uh, is uh, Matt Jagielski. Hopefully Matt is some, oh great, he's starting to share his screen. And, and he'll be talking about um, auditing differentially private machine learning. Um, and so ask, answering the question of how private is private SGD. So uh, take it away, Matthew. Mike, I can't hear you. I don't know if you're saying anything yet. Uh, all right, sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, thank, thanks for the intro. Um, I'm, I'm Matthew, uh, and this is How Private is Private SGD. It's joint work with Jonathan Nolman and Alina Oprea, all of us at Northeastern University. Uh, the, the focus of this talk is DPSGD, which is um, basically the modification of standards to cast a gradient descent to make it differentially private. So your goal here is to minimize some loss function on your data set. And the modifications that uh, DPSGD makes to make it differentially private is when you sample each batch, you compute each gradient for each, uh, each sample, you clip each of these gradients, and then you add noise. And then DPSGD, just like standard SGD, runs many iterations. And what's nice um, about DPSGD is it kind of gives you like this little window in how you go about proving a, a differential privacy like an algorithm satisfies it. So you start with you know, one, one query to your data set, you bound the sensitivity of that query, you add noise to it, and then you run composition if you're running many queries to the data set. And for specific mechanisms, sometimes you'll get um, other types of, of nice privacy things um, to improve. So like amplification by subsampling or amplification by iteration or examples. Um, but basically this is, this is a huge box of tricks and it's the, the product of, of years and years of research to improve these, um, the analysis. And so what we're at today, um, because, because it's been this long line of research, we don't know, you know when it's going to end. So the guarantees we have right now from the analysis might be loose. And what's tough about that is in practice, um, that's, that's a little bit difficult, right? Um, because you don't actually know exactly how private the algorithm you're running is. Um, and what I mean by that is, the analysis, if, if you think the analysis could improve tomorrow by you know, a factor of five, um, then you don't, you don't really know what epsilon you should set today. Um, and so one thing we can do is we can run a tax to get lower bounds on this epsilon. So uh, basically you can think of a tax as, uh, as providing lower bounds on the epsilon and analysis as providing upper bounds. And then sort of the, the gap here between the best attack and the best analysis is where the like true privacy leakage of the, model, the algorithm is going to be. Um, and the size of this gap, the bigger this gap is, the more ambiguous it is for someone who's deploying a differentially private algorithm in practice, um, because they don't know whether a new attack is going to come along tomorrow with significant privacy leakage, or whether new analysis is going to come along tomorrow, um, saying that the algorithm they're running is already way more private than they thought. Um, and so the, the goal of our work is to decrease the size of this gap, and we're going to do this by providing a stronger attack than, than what exists. So today, basically, I'm going to go through the existing attack um, called membership inference, our auditing algorithm that we use to provide these lower bounds, and then how we instantiate our auditing with what's called poisoning attacks. And then I'll do a little bit of discussion of evaluation. So membership inference is a uh, you know, fairly standard uh, attack on machine learning. Um, and the idea is you want to distinguish between points in the training set and points in the test set. And so the, there's a couple of ways that people have done this, um, but the, the, the simplest way is you take a threshold on the loss of some sample. And the idea here is a model's going to perform better on its training set than on its test set. Um, and so you know, if you take a threshold, you should get some good accuracy at distinguishing between these. And once you run a membership inference attack, you can use this to compute a lower bound on the epsilon um, using the, the inference accuracy. Um, so our approach um, takes a sort of different, um, different technique. And basically what we do is we start exactly with the definition of differential privacy. All right, so this probabilistic guarantee here, given some data set, uh, pair of data sets and an output set, um, you have this restriction. And basically what we do is we just compute these probabilities. And if you can compute these probabilities, then you can get a lower bound on epsilon directly. Unfortunately, for even moderately complicated algorithms like DPSGD, um, these probabilities aren't really easy to compute. And so what we do is we use uh, Monte Carlo estimation. So basically the way we go about this 
is we run 100 trials of A on D0, 100 trials of A on D1, and then now we have approximate probabilities. And basically we need, what we would like is some statement like, I have a lower bound on epsilon that I know holds with 99% probability. And you can use what are called clopper pearson confidence intervals to provide a, um, a upper bound on, on P0 and a lower bound on P1 that give you that. Um, and, and this basic technique can also be extended for other types of, of differential privacy or other, other kinds of D0 and D1. So like you can use group privacy or approximate DP. And basically the underlying algorithm, this sort of sampling and, and uh, confidence interval procedure, that's exactly the same. And you just do different math um, to actually get the epsilon. So um, that's, that's basically how the approach works. But what I haven't told you yet is how you actually instantiate it. Right? How do you find this D0, D1, and, and epsilon, uh, or an in, in O output set? And basically what you want here is you want a, a pair D0 and D1 um, that result in very, very different outputs. Um, for a machine learning algorithm, you want two data sets that are close to each other that provide very different models when you run training. And uh, fortunately, there's this area of adversarial machine learning called poisoning attacks. Um, that does exactly this. So the goal of a poisoning attack is to add a small amount of data to your data set that will modify the model significantly according to some objective you've defined. And so if you have a good poisoning attack, um, basically you can set D1 to be your unpoisoned data set, D0 to be your poisoned data set, um, and then you set the output set to be uh, some threshold on the success of the poisoning attack. Um, and then you can run this. And so the sort of the basic attack that we used to start with um, is a backdoor attack. So kind of what you do here um, in a backdoor attack is, uh, let's, let's say we're working with MNIST. You take a couple ones, you flip their labels to be zero, and then you color in a top left pixel. Uh, and basically what the model is going to end up learning is that this top left pixel is really correlated with the class zero, because these points look a lot like ones. And the only thing distinguishing from them from that is this top left pixel. And so basically what you do uh, once you train this model on this data set is you can measure the intensity of this association, um, how, how strongly it associates this top left pixel with the zero class. And you can use that to, um, to measure the success of the attack. And we actually find that, um, that this approach doesn't work super well on DPSGD. It, it, it does something pretty nice, but um, we, we show also how to improve it using a, a new technique that I can't get into here. As I, I want to talk a bit about evaluation now. So we evaluated on three standard uh, data sets, Fashion MNIST, CIFAR 10, and Purchase 100. And we used two models each, logistic regression and a one layer neural network. And to be clear, CIFAR 10 um, is a the kind of standard um, private training, uses a pre-trained model. So logistic regression and one layer neural network on here are on top of that pre-trained model. So um, to, to go through the performance of the attack, this is, this is just one example. So this is on fashion MNIST with a one layer neural network. So the, um, you, there's a couple upper bounds, but the, the main one I want you to focus on here is this blue slanted one, which is the analysis upper bound. The, it's the theoretical upper bound. Um, and then this bottom line here is the standard attack, uh, which is membership inference. And then these middle two are um, the standard poisoning attack plus our auditing algorithm, and then our improved poisoning attack um, plus auditing. And what you can see here is that in some of these situations, uh, for some of these uh, parameters, you get a, a factor of less than 10 from the, uh, the theoretical upper bound and the attack lower bound, All right? So, so this gap here, that's the result of all this improved analysis is now less than 10. And we do this by improving upon membership inference attacks by a factor of over 10. Another interesting thing that we found is our attacks are actually dependent on some parameters of DPSGD that aren't used in its analysis. So when you start a DPSGD run, um, you, you start at some random initialization. Um, and you sample that by using Gaussian noise with some variance. Um, and so if you look at the top table here, um, init rand equals one is, you know, set the, whatever variance you would use. Init rand equals two is you double that variance. Uh, half is have that variance and fixed init means we just take one point and, and always train from that. And what you can see is that as you increase the noise um, of the initialization randomness, 
the performance of our attack goes down. And what's kind of interesting about this is you can, you can kind of see why this might actually provide a little bit of privacy, right? It's like if you took only one step of SD, DPSGD ever, uh, and you had a really large variance for the initialization, it'd be kind of like, uh, like you're running a big Gaussian mechanism. Um, and you're, you're only moving very slightly into it. So I know that's not exactly how, how the Gaussian mechanism works, but um, it's, it's maybe some intuition for why, why having this initialization randomness might provide more privacy. And what's cool about this is maybe, uh, maybe this initialization randomness could be used um, to improve the, uh, the success or the, the analysis of the privacy uh, proof. And what's also cool is, is now if you fix the initialization randomness, we get a gap of roughly five to six um, between the analysis and the attack that we have. Um, that's on the second table. So to, to summarize, um, we have the, uh, an auditing algorithm for measuring the epsilon lower bounds um, for these, these algorithms. Um, we have uh, new data poisoning attacks that, that are able to audit DPSGD fairly successfully um, and get a factor of less than 10 between the theoretical upper bound and the lower bound from our attacks. And we do this by improving significantly over membership inference. And um, we also find that our attacks are sensitive to the initialization uh, that you use in DPSGD, which either gives an opportunity to improve the analysis or, um, or, or it might lead to uh, in, an attack that's less sensitive to the initialization. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you, Matthew, um, for the good talk. Uh, yeah, so uh, we have time for some questions. So feel free to add one to the chat or just unmute your mic and speak. I have a quick question while we're waiting for folks. Um, you mentioned that if you change the kind of initialization parameters that the attack success goes down, does the accuracy of the model, sort of also the, of the final model that you're building also correspondingly go down? Uh, not really. So on the fashion MNIST data set, all the experiments we ran, um, the accuracy is like 98%. And to be clear that it's, um, we're distinguishing between like class zero and class one on fashion MNIST. I'm not sure exactly what, what clothes those are. Um, but that's why the accuracy is like 98%. Okay. Uh, Salil, you have your hand raised. Yeah, hi, Matthew. Thanks for the talk. Uh, could you remind us what the optimal line was on your graph and in what sense uh, it is optimal, whatever it represents? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, I, yeah, I just didn't have a, enough time to go into that. Uh, basically, what it is is um, we're using Clopper Pearson confidence intervals. So Basically, even if you perfectly distinguished, so you measured P0 is 0, P1 is 1, you would still be doing clopper pearson confidence intervals, which would give you P0. You, you can't say P0 is any smaller than like 0.001, or P1 is any larger than uh, 0.99. And so those are the actual values you use for that epsilon, and, and that's why there's an upper bound. Great, thanks. Great. Uh, Joe? Good question. Yeah, this is this is really cool. Thank you for this talk. Uh, I'm, I think this is really cool. Um, you. Have you seen whether this generalizes kind of across model architectures or across data sets? Does how much of an influence does that have on the gap between, uh, you know, the attack and and the theory? Um, yes, that's a good question. We really only experimented with these like smaller models. I guess also because you know smaller models are are the kinds of things that tend to be more successful with DP anyways. Um, but yeah, and I, I haven't looked at, you know, how like a ResNet or something would, would roll with this. Great, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Noice, do you wanna ask a question? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, I, I guess kind of similar to Joel's question, um, have you looked at uh, doing a similar analysis for non-SGD methods for logistic regression? Um, like there are some methods out that do objective perturbation um, that would probably have a tighter privacy guarantee to SGD. Um, have you looked at that or do you have any intuition of what the analysis would look like? 
Yeah, so I'd actually expect that basically the same attack. Uh, so, so basically what you want is for whatever algorithm you're running, you want a poisoning attack that works well for that algorithm. Um, so if you were swapping out DPSTD for something else, you'd want to make sure it still works. I would actually expect that the same poisoning attack that we use would still work fairly well for objective perturbation. I, I haven't run it, but um, that's what I would expect. But also we have some analysis of how well output perturbation um, with linear regression works. So we showed that like our, our attacks get within like a constant factor um, of the upper bound for output perturbation. So I'd expect that objective perturbation would be fairly good too. Cool, thank you. Thank you for the question. Great, thanks very much, Matthew, and thanks for the questions, everyone. Um,